Welcome to the real fake news on kpcradio.com, a critically sarcastic analysis of news. In this show, we'll differentiate real news from the fake with help from comedians, college professors, advocates, and experts. Today, we will discuss taxes, Julian Assange's arrest, comedians dying on stage, and more. I'm your host, Jesse Bertel. So joining me here today, we have comedian Mikey Milios and filmmaker and modern monetary theory proponent Virginia Cotts. Hi, how's it going, guys? Good, good. How's it going? Doing great. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you. So our discussion today will be formatted as a game of real news, fake news, where I'm going to present real news stories or fake news stories, and I'll ask you questions about it. Does that sound good? Sounds Yay. good. All right. Well, now that we know the rules, let's play the game. In real news, the BBC reports that comedian Ian Cognito literally died on stage, giving a whole new meaning to the figurative term dying on stage. <laughs> this reminds me of the time I did stand-up comedy at a retirement home. I killed. <laughs> How many? Uh, what's your, like, death count? Uh, I don't want to tell anybody because the government. No, I'm just I want to know how old he was. <laughs> I think he was sixty. Oh my God, so young. Yes, he was. Uh, I mean, it's a matter of perspective, I suppose. <laughs> um, I um, I feel like I read the article and because uh, I'm I'm like into this stuff, um, and um, he actually died, and for five minutes. He was on stage for a whole five minutes, and people were laughing and didn't know he had died. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. crazy. I mean, what does that tell us about human nature, that everyone thought it was part of the act, yeah. like real real news or fake news? You know what I mean? Like, it's well, so hard to tell. Well, comedy, comedy is about, like, uh, creating tension and releasing tension. So they probably just thought it was escalating the tension, and then they found out that there was no joke. And, and some of the more interesting comics will push that yeah. beyond what people think is acceptable yeah, yeah. sort of longer and some of the greatest comedians have been like that it's almost like by by pushing it so far and then having no punchline at the end he he became an alt comic or, or something <laughs> it's uh i feel like i feel like though dying on stage is like like literally dying it's like he did he died doing what he loved yeah. and it's the best way to go out i know right for a comedian that must be like yeah there you go and the fact that people were laughing <laughs> on stage yeah for five minutes <laughs> Even after, it's like... It kind of does show that he must have been pretty good. I yeah. mean, he must have done his job, right? No, 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 no. Don't you want to kill on stage and not die on stage? <laughs> you do, but good he point. killed while he was dying. Oh, okay. Yeah, he... There you go. Simultaneous. Okay. Killed and died at the same okay. time. You know, it's like I've it died bloodbath. plenty of times on stage and then wish I could kill myself. <laughs> but that's... Uh, that's He'll uh, certainly be remembered. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> that's some real fake news. Okay, let's move on. Let's play again. In fake news, common commondreams.org reports that NPR tried to deceive the public by lying about Julian Assange's arrest in a live interview with award-winning journalist Glenn Greenwald and then removing the interview from the online portion of the show. So does Julian Assange's arrest reveal a threat to press freedom not only from the government but from the press itself? Absolutely. And I don't understand the media, the mainstream media going after Julian Assange. Tomorrow it could be them. My understanding is that he's being charged with encouraging Chelsea Manning to get more information, hmm. which is what a journalist does. exactly what journalists do, yeah. yeah. Yeah, chase down leads. Yeah. Well, some people exactly. think he's been charged with the hacking, but I looked at it, and if you listen to the Greenwald interview, right. that's not... In the indictment, he, yeah. it was that he wasn't classified to receive right. classified. I mean, <laughs> what? Yeah, but then yeah. either was like all the, all the New York Times and yeah. all, all the outlets that the later then yeah. uh, posted the same stuff. Right. You know, it's like, why does it stop there? You know, like, they, I guess they say that it was like public domain at that point. But... Um, I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, like, why, why is Assange the guy that's on the hook for it? He just got the information and then gave it to the world. You know, uh, Rebecca Rice, one of the writers for Real Progressives, uh, just did an article called um, We Should Talk About Julian. 
And I think that's the perfect title, because I think we all should talk about why we're letting this happen. Why isn't the left up in arms? It's a threat to all of us. The Pentagon Papers had a lot to do with ending the Vietnam Mm -hmm. War. And I know about that because I'm old and I was there. You were there, yeah. (laughs) But no, it's really true. We We need people like Julian Assange. But you know what else really annoys me? is that sex thing hanging over him. They always use right. sex or money. He was, or, or in his case now, they're saying he was messy in the embassy. He, <laughs> he, he exposed, was a bad guest. He exposed the hypocrisy of the new president of, yeah. of um, Ecuador. But by the, while the country is living under austerity conditions, the president was feasting on lobster from, but, um, with his <laughs> with his offshore account. In his golden yeah. tower. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's um, and it's it's interesting too that um, NPR put it out and then re- like took took out part of the interview. Interesting, yeah. Isn't you it? know, to their it's like not what journalists are supposed to be doing. Yeah. To their um, to their credit, they did post uh, putting up this uh, Glenn Greenwald article. Feeling cute, might delete later. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> these things happen. We all, everyone, everyone, we all try to re- take things back when, if if we can. Right. You know, do you guys, uh, do you guys live in? You you moved to LA five years ago. Right. Like you drive? Do you drive in LA? I hate driving in LA, but sometimes I have to. Well, some sometimes you'll be driving and people will put on their their blinker to cut into your lane, and if you don't let them in, they'll just turn it off and act like they didn't want to go that way anymore. You know, Sa- saving face, you mean? Yeah, it's like, oh, oh no, I live here now. This is basically <laughs> what... It's human nature to like, oh, my God, should I pull this back? You know, and so I, I do like... I, I kind of feel for NPR, but at the same time, <laughs> they need, they're journalists and they need to have integrity. Yeah, well, it's what uh, Chomsky calls <laughs> flack in the industry uh, that pressures other journalists to act the same way and mm-hmm. to follow the same path that the rest mm-hmm. of the journalists, which is important in a lot of ways, but it also leads to an opening for propaganda, uh, both from corporations and from government. What do you think about this? I think that's what the mainstream media is about. Um, this, this concept of journalistic objectivity really means the status quo. Mm-hmm. It really means the capitalist corporate media that they're going along with the system. So if you don't have an opinion, you have an opinion. Yeah. I also also feel like the um, with the whole the Russians narrative, it was like the the official news narrative is that they spent one hundred and forty thousand on Facebook ads. And that's what re- that's what uh, swayed the election. Who has more influence? One hundred and forty thousand in targeted ads or the entire mainstream media apparatus telling us 24-7 on every television who's going to win, you know? <laughs> right. And so they it's basically, it's on them. Yeah. They, they, they're the ones who, 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 who um, elevated Trump, showed Trump, 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 Trump. Absolutely. And, then, and then when he wins, they're like, <laughs> we need a scapegoat. It's quick, the Russians. And it's funny because they just go back mm-hmm. to McCarthyism. And it's like the left are supposed to be the progressive people that aren't falling for like... Uh, uh, xenophobia mm-hmm. and and all these threats and 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 all of a sudden it's like, well these people are white enough to be xenophobic about, you know and so now we're now it's like it's all good. Oh, I never thought of it that well, way. Well, there's also a fine line <laughs> between I think what progressives are talking about when it comes to uh, fake news mm-hmm. and what Trump is talking about when he talks about mm-hmm. fake news. Right. Absolutely. Um, would you agree with that? I mean, y- yeah, I mean. The organization I'm here representing is Real Progressives, and we are constantly dissecting the news stories and looking for the nugget of truth, Mm. especially when it comes to economics. As you know, that's my area of interest. So when progressives talk about fake news, how does it differentiate from, say, Trump's, uh, you know, obviously bad press about him is fake news? (laughs) Well, I think it has to do with with the emphasis. The... American elections are controlled by the mainstream media. We get all of our information. The candidates can go out and speak, but if we don't get it from the television or the newspaper, if they don't report it to us, we don't know what they're saying. And we don't know their histories. 
that's that's fake news. If they ignore Bernie Sanders, it's fake news. He's the most popular politician right now. And they pretend like he's just one of the... Hmm, some some uh, what do you call it novelty yeah, saw, novelty candidate. I saw a headline that his uh, massive support is troubling to the DNC now. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, why this should be good, right? Yeah. Don't we want to win? No. I, saw, I saw a headline <laughs> no, that uh, a, they Fox, don't. a Fox News um, reporter said that it's troubling because uh, on the surface his policies seem very reasonable. And so, it was yeah. like, like um, and it's attractive to the. Except that it's, yeah. it's attractive to the American people, so it's troubling. Oh yeah, I know that's that's scary stuff. When it could work, yeah, and even like it's. <laughs> we like, don't want it to work too fast. Yeah, and even him going to do Fox, it was like he's copying flack. It's like everyone has just. It's become. It's supposed to be about um, the people. It's not. It's not about si- our side is better. It's like how do we progress as a country. But people are like, we don't talk to them. We don't, we ignore them. It's like, you guys out, you reach out, you know, like it's easy to like push people away. There's a story. Um, I feel it's relevant. Um, there was, um, I feel a lot of people on the, on, on both sides actually push people away rather than bringing them in, Yes. you know? And there was, um, there was this, um, uh, uh, African American jazz musician called, uh, I believe Daryl Davis and the KKK showed up on his door. Mm. And what he did was he invited them in for drinks and over whatever length of his time got 200 people to quit the KKK, <laughs> you know? Wow. It's easy to go out and say, you're wrong, but you bring people in and you're like, all right, let's talk about this. Wow. And then, and people like after a while, they just couldn't reconcile that or whatever their views like, you know, um, all black people are terrible and this dude's cool. Yeah. And at the same, like at, so for a long time, they would be like, well, this one guy. And then it's just like, eventually they're like, I can't do this anymore. Nothing is really that black and white in the world. There's so much nuance, but the media has to form a dichotomy, a false dichotomy a lot of the time because they need to, you know, they need people to watch. And without a battle, you know, without a this team versus this team, it's it's hard to keep people like on edge. What's going to happen next? All right. Well, let's go ahead and move on to the next story. Let's play again. In real news, according to CBS News, minimum wage would be $33 today if it grew like Wall Street bonuses have. Um, So you guys think the federal minimum wage should see a 1,000% increase just like wealthy CEOs have seen since 1985? I I think it's time we introduce a uh, minimum wage bonuses for for minimum wage jobs, where if you do your minimum wage job, you get a bonus. And uh, it can also no, I don't think that at all. No, um, <laughs> the um, it's hard because it's like in the in the capitalist society, it's like these are the jobs that people want to do. They make the money, and then they need to do something with it to avoid taxes. And so they, I guess they give them as bonuses or uh, it's incentives, and that's where all the money is. So that's how they it goes. Well, I'm kind of looking at it from a different perspective, but. The minimum wage is still seven dollars and twenty five cents. Yeah. Imagine trying to raise a family. You're a single dad. Imagine trying to raise a family on seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour, or trying to pay off your student debt. I mean, really. I know all about that too. <laughs> but but, and and the fifteen dollar minimum wage, which was proposed, I don't know, eight or nine years ago already. Now, finally, the Democratic Party, at least, is coming around to it. I know Bernie bullied uh, Amazon (laughs) into paying. I think $15 is too low if you live in Los Angeles or New York, certainly. So $33 makes a lot of sense. But, But let me say something. There are two main groups that benefit from suppressing wages, which is what's been happening to the American worker for 40, 50 years. One is the actual people who pay them, the the corporate, their employers, and the other is the financial industry. Because when you don't make enough money, what do you do? You use your credit card, Mm -hmm. you take out mortgages, you certainly take out student loans. I'm sure people on Pierce (laughs) campus can relate to that. So there are two very powerful interest groups. Who, who want to keep the minimum wage suppressed, to keep wages suppressed in general. And you're, uh, you said, a part of the real progressives, which right. uh, they're, one of their big things is uh, modern monetary modern theory. Modern monetary theory. Um, and we believe 
that it, those of us who, who are proponents of understanding modern monetary theory believe in a federal job guarantee, which would lift the bottom up. It would, it would create a blanket of employed workers. Imagine if you're making $7.25 at McDonald's and the federal job guarantee is in your town. You can walk out the door and go get a guaranteed job for $15 or whatever the minimum wage is. Right. I'm hoping it'll be more than 15 but 15 seems to be the consensus right now. Let's start with something. I mean, right. it's not enough in Los Angeles, but... You know, in middle America, they, yeah, that would be at least, I mean, something. It's more than double the minimum wage I read right that uh, just getting out of poverty is around one hundred to 150000 in most major cities. Yeah. Just barely out of poverty. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's yeah. now the lower yeah. middle class. So that 33, what did you say it was? If if, if the minimum wage had yeah. come up, yeah, 30, that sounds a little more reasonable. Yeah, I it? think it does. I mean, yeah. 33. I, yeah. I could use a raise. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't like it's, I don't, I'm not like, I don't disagree and I don't know enough, but it's like, do we, what are the implications of raising the, the minimum wage? Like, how does that affect all of the everything? Like, if, if all the cost of business goes up, because it's hard because in the in the um, economic model that we have, if um, in with a capitalist system, if you're not having growth for two years, it, then you're in a recession. You know, it's, it doesn't I feel like the capitalist model is actually unsustainable because it, basically you have to make more profit like say we were a company we had a company we made a billion dollars this year that's mm -hmm. that's great mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um next year we made 900 million that's awesome you're a failure yeah. <laughs> but 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 we next year we make 899 million oh yeah. okay or we're declining yeah you know but that's still amazing money why does it have to be more every year but that's the basic law of capitalism increase you know, the rate of but profit. then that's not sustainable either that means then things have to fail to make room for new things or because it's a zero sum, like there's only so much money. I'm a socialist. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. But but let me also say the, the organization I represent is not necessarily socialist. Some of us are. But I think however we get there, if we can find a way to bring prosperity to everyone, then I don't care what system it's under. If All we right. can make it work under capitalism, okay. We better move on at that note. So let's play again. In fake news, the Washington Post reports that Bernie Sanders has too much money to speak to working class uh, Americans. Is this true? Uh, is Bernie Sanders now part of the 1% that he so famously rallies against? Does this make uh, his presidential campaign irrelevant? No, um, can I, can I yes. say, I say no. Can Billy Joel still sing Piano Man to blue collar workers? <laughs> if the answer is yes, then Bernie can still spit. It's the same song that he wrote 40 years ago. You know, he's been saying the same thing, you know, just because he's doing better for himself. Like, in fact, he should, like, we all still love him because it's not about uh, him being broke or poor. It's about him, his message, you know? And, and uh, now now maybe some of the people that uh, care about how much money someone has will, will start to find him more appealing too, you know? You know what? You know what's so interesting about political campaigns? No, about the American people's reaction. It's like we've all signed on to this social compact that we're going to, instead of looking at candidates for what they've done, what they're really saying, yeah. we play the we play the horse race game. So it's it's like some kind of postmodern weirdness where the media is saying. Not does Bernie's money affect, not would his money affect him as a president, but will it affect the way that people perceive him in the race, but yeah. the way that people perceive him is through the media. So it's this kind of auto cannibalism <laughs> of the media reporting on the media report. You, yeah. it, does that sound crazy? Yes, because it, it is. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But my feeling is that I want people to be lifted up. I don't care if Bernie has money. I mean, first of all, does he own factories in India and China where he's making small children work for pennies a day making designer clothes? No, he wrote a book. 
come on. <laughs> I mean, and he's 80 years old. People are telling me he's got three houses. I'm like, at 80. Yeah. You know, it's like, um, yeah. that's like, how, like, I don't know. Like, it's not, by any means, you wouldn't think someone that has like uh, $2 million in assets is killing it. Like, at one house is can be two million dollars. Yeah, where we, you know what I mean. But anybody who thinks Bernie's in it for the money doesn't know his history. So socialists want the American dream too. Then is that what? You're... Absolutely. <laughs> so um, why not? When you talk about socialism, we're talking more of a mix of capitalistic socialism kind of thing. Then because other, I mean, pure socialism is completely shared, well, isn't it? I mean, so you can't have three houses unless your neighbor has three well, houses. I, I feel it's I like know. socialism where it where it matters to the people. You know, things that are, that affect society like prisons and, and, med, and education and schools, I don't think they necessarily should be like based on pr- profit schemes because then that starts to take, like it actually becomes a detriment to society cool you can go to private schools and stuff but we still want we, we want people to be smart right and we want people to be healthy and not like like the rich people complain about how many homeless people there are why because they can't afford to pay for their hospital bills so if we just shift the shift the expense from like like what bernie's saying from having crazy premiums and crazy uh um uh, insurance prices just to everyone pays a bit more tax and then it's then it's all good. You well, know? I totally disagree on that. Oh, yeah? Because taxes, federal taxes do not fund federal spending. Okay. And that's what modern monetary theory, and I really hope you look into it because... Yeah, I remember that being the big thing with, uh, I mean... Yeah. Obviously, and, economics is not my... <laughs> I don't, oh, it's not it's, mine either. Okay. But it, but I understand how important it is. So I've uh, So I'm educating myself on it. But, and there are some amazing teachers out there, including uh, the Real Progressives founder, Steve Grumbine, who has, who has interviewed all of the great MMT teachers. But so, let me just say that Bernie's economics advisor for the second campaign in a row is Stephanie Kelton, one of the originators of modern monetary theory. So I'm not oh. sure why Bernie's still talking about taxes to fund spending. Surely he knows better So where, where do the federal taxes go? Well, it's... Taxes serve a purpose, but uh, the federal government creates money in the U.S., in Australia, not in Germany, France, and Italy, and Greece because they're on the euro, sure. but England. So, so the federal government creates money. In fact, in the U.S., the dollar is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government, not gold, not your taxes, not bond sales. All right, well, let's do our last story of the day. Let's play again. In real news, tax day was this week, and according to the New York Intelligencer, tax refunds are down, which could be bad for both Trump and for the economy. Um, How is it bad for Trump? (laughs) Because he promised this miracle. Tax relief, yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting because I read the reason that it's down is that Trump, uh, told the IRS to stop collecting as much uh, taxes so that people could see a small bump in their take-home Paychecks, pay. Yeah. So basically, he um, he just took their tax returns <laughs> and gave it to them through the year. And then uh, when it came tax day, they 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 maybe had to pay some, or they got yeah. no, no, they got like when I was small... doing my taxes, it was in a larger room of other people doing, yeah. it, and there was people next to me like, wait, what do you mean I owe money? Right, yeah. uh, uh, I right. owe sixty dollars. I I should be getting a couple hundred at least. I always get, you know, I've been doing the same thing, and uh, yeah, you know, I do um, independent contracts, so actually mine went up. But most people's, if you do a normal nine to five and it's salaried or whatever. You're going to end up paying a little bit more, uh, I think, probably just, though, on the lower end, right? right. Uh, does this affect the uh, super rich or? <laughs> it never seems to, does it? <laughs> right. But I think I it's yeah. affecting the, um, what, what I read is that it's affecting consumer spending. So on some level, yes. you know, um, people are going to stop spending. So it will affect, it will affect them, but n- not enough for like you know they're still getting massive tax breaks so (laughs) at the end of the day not enough i I think the middle class should pay a lot less in taxes and small businesses should pay a lot less i think it's crazy you were asking what taxes are for yeah 
one of the things they can be for is to uh, eliminate such inequality. You tax the rich more, not because we need their money to pay for anything, but because they have all this money, they're using it for the wrong things, like buying Congress. And so why do they need it? I, uh, but, mm-hmm. but my concern is more bringing the people up rather than the up down. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. This has been a really great conversation, and I don't normally say that. I really appreciate you guys. Um, but before I go, I'd like to give you both a chance to tell our listeners where they can find out more about you. Mike, you want to start? Sure, yeah. You can um, find me on Instagram and Twitter and on my website, and they're all the same. Mikey Milios, uh, obviously, dot com for the website and just at for the other two. Uh, I have some shows coming up. Um, I have one on Friday at Cultura Esubura um, on Franklin. And I don't know what the cross section is. And uh, But there's stuff on my website. Yep. All right, Virginia. Oh, well, I'm at Real Progressives, and we have a wonderful podcast, if you're interested in MMT in particular, called Macro and Cheese. And if you look it up, it's Macron, like the okay. like the French president, macroncheese.com. Macron cheese. Right. Real Progressives has Facebook. We have a website. We have Twitter. If you just ser- put it in your search engine, Real Progressives, you'll get all of those links. Awesome. Well, thank you both for joining me here today on The Real Fake News. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks for having us. This was and great. thanks to our listeners for tuning in. On the next episode, my guests will be comedian and progressive activist Elizabeth Croydon and best-selling author and organizer Luis J. Rodriguez. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Patreon at Jesse Bertel. Tune in to The Real Fake News every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. on kpcradio.com and the following day on my YouTube. Real Fake, Real Fake, Real Fake. Cool, this was good. Awesome. That was one of my favorite shows so far. I really appreciate really? you guys. Yeah. Um, they've been up and down and this has been this was a good one. Oh, that's amazing. Well that's because you have incredible yeah, you guests. Uh-huh.